It's that time of year where people are wanting to add birds to their flock, but what if you accidentally buy your bird a buddy that wants to murder him? We're going to be talking about a lot of that kind of stuff, the territorial issues, and a whole lot more on today's podcast. Parrots are the third most popular pet in the world, but the number one most rehomed. Celebrity parrot trainers Dave and Jamie Womack from Bird Tricks combine nearly four decades of parrot training expertise to help put an end to abandoned parrots as they save parrots one person at a time. Welcome to the Parrot Training Podcast. And now, here are your hosts, Dave and Jamie Womack. Hey everybody, welcome to another session of the Parrot Training Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Womack, here with my beautiful wife, Jamie Lee, and we are from Bird Tricks. Today, we're gonna to be talking about buying a new baby bird because a lot of people this time of year are coming home with either a baby bird or an adopted bird because it's springtime and everybody wants to add another bird to the flock, but here's the problem. So many people are like, hey, my conure is going to want a buddy, so I got him another conure, and now he wants to kill him. This happens a lot of times. You can't buy your, your kid a best friend any more than you can buy your bird a best buddy. They get to pick that favorite bird, right? And so we're going to be talking about a few different topics here. Uh, territorial, where you're talking about food, where you're talking about stands, and how you can actually use jealousy to be able to work your bird better based on the introduction of this new bird. So one of the things that we did was we had Bondi who is about, is she three or four years older than Cressy? And when we got so. Cressy, we thought, hey, African Grey, Gala, they're relatively the same size. Um, and so we thought we really want them to be, mm, I wouldn't say pals. <laughs> we weren't really going for pals, but we were going for neutral. And we simplicity. To get along, yeah. but not be like, hey, I prefer you over my humans. Yeah. So when we went to make the introduction for them, we were very, very methodical in how we went about it. And we made sure it was neutral space. We made sure that we got actually a brand new cage um, that was really beautiful at the time. And, uh, <laughs> and, and we put them both in it at the exact same time. And there was a lot of little simple things that we did that made a huge difference overall in introducing these two birds for the very first time. Yeah, so let's talk about, we, uh, you know, we've covered cage territorialism, right? We had a nice laugh about that being a new word. Look it up, Wikipedia. And so the whole thing, no, don't actually, I don't know if it's a word. But the whole thing about it is that if you have an older bird that's been in your house or your care for 10 years or two years, it doesn't really matter. Well, the bird owns his space, that's his cage. So if you take a helpless, cute little, huge pupiled African gray and you add it into there as a sweet little baby, it's gonna get mauled by this other animal protecting its nest. It's springtime, it's protecting its nest right now. That's the most important thing to keep in mind. So one of the things that we've done and had a lot of success with is, as Jamie said, introducing them into a new space together so it's neutral. And you don't leave them there unattended and you, you wanna supervise that whole experience, but you also wanna make sure it's large enough that they're not both crammed into this. We had an example with somebody we spoke to today said, oh, they've got a really big cage. It's 36 by 42. And that's, you know, three feet by Inches. almost four feet. You know, that's that might be really big for a budgie, but even with that, I, I wouldn't put two birds in there and expect them to get along. The cage that Jamie's talking about, I think was four feet by eight feet by four feet. So, and it was horizontal. So it was a lot of space for two medium sized birds. And you have to remember too, because it's a brand new space for both birds, they were able to check it out at the same time. So one wasn't accustomed to it and knew its way around while the other one was like, oh, I don't know where I am because that would be an unfair advantage. They both were put into a brand new environment and they both were more interested in exploring that environment than each other right away. So mm -hmm. when you put them in too small of a space where they're forced to interact, it's a very uncomfortable situation for the bird, which will most likely lead to a bad outcome because when we're all uncomfortable, we act differently versus when we're relaxed and comfortable with the situation. So you wanna make sure that it's as neutral as possible. And also I don't recommend doing this with an adult bird with a baby bird because immediately that baby bird is at a disadvantage. A baby bird isn't gonna do anything to an adult bird, but an adult bird can pick on a baby bird. And you never want the relationship to start out like Sorry, that because when that way. baby does get older, he's gonna be trying to look for ways to bully later on. So you just wanna be really careful about that. Don't, um, like we kind of felt like we were stacking the deck correctly because we waited until Cressy was no longer a baby when we introduced them. Yeah, and let's be fair too. You know, there's no perfect answer to this. The solution is try a few things, see which works the best, make sure it's supervised, 
And here, here's probably the most important thing. Think through the worst case what if. Yeah. Don't just blindly put them together and think they're going to get along because you want them to because you bought them a buddy, right? It just doesn't work that way. And it goes back to the old saying, fight or flight. So a lot of people ask us when we take our birds outside, um, do they fight? And when they're outside, they all have been trained to fly properly, ours have. So rather than get in a fight where they could risk losing a limb or getting injured, which in the wild translates to death, they would rather just fly away from that situation, go to a different tree, go to a different person, a different perch, a different car and wait it out. And so you wanna make sure that you have a large enough area to introduce those two birds and make sure that you're dealing with two birds of similar skill levels. So Cressy was a free flighted parrot and Bondi flew in the house. She wasn't an outdoor flyer yet, but they both possessed amazing flight skills. So when we put them together, they're the similar size and it was in a neutral space and they had the ability to get away. Definitely, I agree. Another really important thing about that is the food. So you gotta be aware that the birds will become very territorial of not only their cage, but also of their food. There's typically a pecking order in the group. So you'll have a bird that's gonna be a little bit more dominant over the food bowl and will, if you only have one food and one water, they have been known to kill the other birds defending that food bowl or defending, it's not usually over the water, but it can happen, but defending their side of the cage. So the great thing about when we introduced Bondi and Cressy, we had a food and water bowl on one side and eight feet across the cage where there's an eight foot perch that was full of different obstacles. If you heard our, our podcast about making your bird's life harder, that's the aviary that we're talking about. It was eight feet across, there was ropes and stuff to make it difficult for one bird to walk from one side to the other. And, Go listen to that podcast if you haven't yet. There's some really great information there about why you want to make your bird's life slightly more difficult. But it also served another purpose here because they were at opposite ends of the cage. And so Bondi had her food and water. Cressy had her food and water. And nobody had to be defensive over it. Yeah. If we put them into the same aviary now, Cressy makes his glop. <laughs> yes. <laughs> As you guys probably are aware of with your own birds. And, uh, and we'll keep Bondi from getting to her own food. So we have to be very careful to make sure even now, as two birds that get along most of the time, if we put them in the same aviary for a week or even just a couple of days, we wanna make sure that they each have their own separate feeding stations. And I will say, if you have the idea of, hey, I should get my bird a friend, because maybe you are at work all day and you feel guilty that your bird's alone, or for whatever reason, you believe that your bird needs a friend, Keep in mind that unless you're okay with the worst case scenario, you should not invest in getting your bird a quote unquote friend. So the consultation that we did today, the person had a green cheek conure and thought, well, we're away all day, he's all by himself. Even said at night, he sleeps all by himself and I think we should get him a friend. And I thought, are you okay? Actually, I didn't think it, I said it, <laughs> cause that's what I do. Uh, yeah, so I said, are you okay with the worst case scenario of your bird not interpreting his new friend as a friend and worst case, they do not get along and then you need another cage and now you have twice the work. Are you okay with that? If that is what happens, can you accept that? And he couldn't. He couldn't, you know, here's the, here's the reality that people forget is it's an additional 500 or 1500 or $5,000 cage. It's an additional, we, we had a good laugh with somebody. Oh, I was looking at buying your toy line and they did the math and like, but I want to spend $1,000 a, a year on toys. So I spent $2,000 a year on toys at the local shop. Yeah, she literally and, goes like, oh, but I get these other ones. They're like 40 bucks a piece. I was like, mm, doing I'm the pretty math. sure we have toy boxes for 40 <laughs> bucks that have three toys in them, but it's cool. Uh <laughs> so, sorry, I know she's listening to this too. We still love you. Uh, but here's the reality with that is that you are now doubling your expense with the toys, doubling your expense with the food, and you gotta buy another cage. And, and you're doubling your time, the uh, time that you felt guilty that, about not having you just doubled because now you have to also spend time training and working with this other bird that you're bringing in. So I, I really hope that people think it through. Not that it's always gonna work out worst case scenario. I'm sure a lot of you are gonna leave comments and be like, hey, I bought my bird a buddy and they really are buddies and now I can't handle them. But, exactly, now they just wanna mate, I don't know why. <laughs> but um, I just hope that most people getting into this think about it and expect, almost expect the worst case scenario and make sure that you can accept that because if you can't, you might end up just having to rehome a bird, which is a sad reality. That's so true, it's so true. 
So consider those things. Here's something else to consider. Birds, some birds, have the, the instinct, if you will, to, if they're bullied when they're little, just like with people, right? If the bird's bullied as a little baby bird growing up and eventually it hits maturity and it's gonna, there's going to be some point where that bird's going to fight back. A great kind of one-off situation is Cressy got chased by some seagulls and man, did it piss her off. And so 13 seagulls came after her, tried to attack her, uh, tried to kill her. Well, so we didn't, we were really worried. We're like, hey, you know, I don't, this is 10, 10 years ago now, right? So we're like, gosh, is she, is she gonna be afraid to free fly because now everybody, she's gonna think everybody's after her. So we took her out, we had her in a little dog crate transport so she could see out. We had it in the middle of the field and we're looking around and we don't see any predators. We see a little crow eating a mouse at the top of this telephone pole and, and we're sitting her there for a bit. Then we take her out, she goes straight for the crow and whoops him. Right, because she could beat that, that bird up because she's got bullied the day before. Now, if that's her exact thought process, I don't know, obviously, but she had never shown that sort of aggression towards anything and still to this day never has. But with those 13 birds coming after her and her surviving it, she was hell bent to take it out on someone else. <laughs> so, so recognize that, what is your flock dynamic going to be if you add another bird? And is there going to be like, hey, you know, it's okay because that bird's going to be bigger or that bird's smaller. And it, whatever, whatever reasoning that, that seems like a justifiable excuse, think about what happens a year from now, two years from now, tomorrow. You know, what's going to happen when that bird hits its breaking point? And I would honestly research the owners that do have two birds because a lot of them are struggling with, when I try to work with one, it just calls to the other. It just wants to be with the other one. I can't separate them. I mean, we've had master classes where they're like, can I bring two birds? Cause they're super bonded. I can't separate them. So think about, again, it's like that worst case scenario thing. Think about worst case scenario. What if, what if they are buddies? You know, mm -hmm. like you want them to be buddies. What if they're so buddy buddy that they want nothing to do with you? What if you, in essence, lose your bond? As I heard a lot of, I hear a lot of people talk about, they worry about losing their relationship or losing their bond with their bird if they do get it a buddy. Um, so there's, there's literally two different routes it can go. It can go, you got it a buddy and now it wants nothing to do with you. It just wants to go and be a bird. Or the other route, which is, <laughs> we all know. <laughs> I want to bring up how to use jealousy in your favor. So uh, I, I pause here for a second, just thinking about the different scenarios that we've run into this and reflecting on our own situation and other people's stories. I found you might, I don't know if you agree with this, but I found that it's easiest when, when you, okay. So when you have one bird and you want to get it a buddy and you get a second one and it could be a large bird and a small bird, it could be two medium sized birds. When you get that second bird, your relationship with the first bird that you've built so much, it's going to lack. It's going to cause a certain effect on that bird. Now, let's say down the road, you get bird number three, four, five, six, seven. All of those birds have grown up and been introduced into the family with other birds already there. So they're used to sharing the attention. But that very first bird that you have, in my opinion, my experience, my my viewpoint is that that bird is always going to show a little bit more tendency to be jealous. I don't, do you agree with that? In like you relation to Bondi maybe? Cause she was with, our first one. With Bondi, yeah, yeah, it was harder. I remember it was harder for her when we introduced another bird and, and more recently, you know, sorry, Claudia, <laughs> with Sunshine, when she, when she got Vicky, Sunshine yes. kind of went through a funk where it was like, you know, this, this whole situation of like, ah, oh, I thought I was, I thought I was your bird. You know, yeah. and I, I feel like the people that have that first bird that they do so well with, when they get that second bird, uh, and, and I'm not trying to say, I don't, I don't know if Claudia bought it because she wanted to get Sunshine a, a buddy. I don't think that's the case, but when people buy that second bird, whatever the reason, it, it usually is going to cause that first bird to have more of a jealous, jealousy issue. But here's the good news. If you get birds three, four, and five, <laughs> that, that diminishes with each purchase. I think uh, we call this multiple bird syndrome. <laughs> yeah, but there is a benefit to it and that's using the bird's natural jealousy to be able to get extra effort out of flighty behaviors. I don't know if you want to kind of talk a little bit about uh, like with Morgan and, and how some of the training you did with her 
Yeah, sometimes when she wasn't responsive, I would bring Jinx out and then suddenly she was responsive again. She really works well with Jealousy, whereas some of you that follow our channel uh, a bit more may have seen me trying to recondition my Camelot Macaw Comet. And he, I found, you know, I was trying to provoke him and encourage him to fly and I thought using his brother Tusa would help and honestly, it just made him quit. So he did not respond at all to Jealousy. He actually just yeah. gave up. So, so there's different responses with different birds, but for sure you can use jealousy sometimes. I remember using it early on with Bandit when, when I, I got frustrated trying to teach him to target of all things. It should be something really simple. And he just showed no interest. Well, when he saw Bondi targeting and getting a treat, suddenly he was interested because he was jealous of the whole thing and he came over and that's how I ended up teaching him to target. Yeah. And so um, it's really interesting how you can use jealousy, but then also you need to recognize when it's not working or it's unhealthy because even with Sunshine, I remember a day where she, Claudia could not get Sunshine out of the aviary. She used jealousy to do it because Sunshine even gets jealous of attention with the dogs. Yeah. And Claudia went and started paying attention to the dogs <laughs> and then Sunshine wanted to come out, but it was almost like under this false pretense and the, the day wasn't really set up for success in that route. So you have to be careful of how much you use the jealousy and make sure that it's done in a way that is benefiting the bird and, the, and your relationship with the bird. In the case of Morgan, I would say it benefited, but in the case of Jinx, it did not benefit my relationship with him. Yeah. So guys, uh, we're just talking really specifically about the behavior side of this. Obviously go to a vet or consult somebody that really is focused on the quarantine side of it. Uh, I mean, we'll give you a couple recommendations for that, but if you are bringing in a new bird, take your precautions. Uh, I'll, let, I'll let Jamie share some insight on that or some thoughts on yeah, that. Yeah, we can probably just link to a, a certain blog post in the description. That'll be easiest because it'll have all the information for you guys about quarantine if you're interested in that because those of you that aren't interested in it don't have to hear about yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> and then here's the other thing about it. One of the examples that Jamie shared is that, hey, you know, my bird wanted a buddy to sleep alone. Um, he wasn't alone. He was sleeping right next to 10 budgies. So if if they can see the other birds or even if they can hear them, they're still part of the flock. So the, you know, if you want to buy another bird, go buy another bird. Um, but if you're doing it out of a deeper reason that you think the bird wants it, as we've said through for the last 20 minutes, be very cautious of what approach you take and what your reasoning is and just be aware of the dangers. Think through what's the worst case and make sure that you make a really smart decision on, on what's best for the bird. And here's the other realistic picture. What's gonna be best for the people that take this bird in 50 or 80 years from now, right? How are you setting them up for success too? How are you setting that bird up for a lifetime of success down the road? And I think it even draws back to one of our earlier podcasts about anthropomorphizing or projecting your human emotions on the bird. I think a lot of times that is what people are doing when they say, my bird's lonely, my bird needs a buddy. Mm -hmm. I think it's your own guilt of feeling like maybe you should have never got the bird in the first place. Maybe you're not really a good home for a bird because you feel like you work a majority of the day and you don't have time to spend with it. If that's the case, you need to reevaluate your situation, not bring on another bird to put in the same environment. Like that doesn't yeah. make sense to me. So so just um, just really reevaluate and look inside yourself before you start adding more animals. Wow. Sorry guys. Well said. Hope that was, I feel like that might've been harsh. <laughs> On that, I want to say uh, with a sincere, heartfelt gratitude, thank you everybody so much for the comments you've left on YouTube. I mentioned a couple of podcasts ago that we're doing a contest as well. Uh, to enter the contest, we're going to be giving away some free stuff. We are coming out with some new products, a hormones course, a stop screaming course, a foraging course. Some of you may have noticed we just added merch and yeah. we started with Comet, a design that we got of Comet. So if you haven't checked that out, it should be below this YouTube video, right below and under. <laughs> we have some Comet stuff out. And if you're listening to us on iTunes, you can check out youtube.com slash bird tricks to see what we're talking about. But uh, we are going to be giving away a lot of that merchandise and a lot of those new courses. So to enter, all you have to do is leave us a review over on iTunes, take a screen capture, send it to info at and, uh, and and we will enter you into the contest that way to, to win some free stuff. We'll autograph some stuff. We'll give you digital stuff. We'll give you physical stuff. We're just here to make this uh, it, uh, the best community can, best community that we can to be able to help other bird owners save birds one person at a time. And again, thank you with, with all sincerity. We're in the thousands of downloads, thousands and thousands of views now with these podcasts. And it's a different format than 
you're used to for the rest of our channel, so. Yeah, for sure. And just keep in mind, I know a lot of you are probably thinking like, oh, so many people listen to these podcasts and so many people do this and, and that and so many people are submitting, but keep in mind, people are lazy. So go ahead and take the chance and submit your review, like Dave's saying, send us an email, info at birdtricks.com. I promise you guys have a better chance than you're probably thinking you do. Again, people are lazy, sorry guys, but. What she's trying to say is we have a lot of reviews and only two submissions. Myself so, included. So uh, make sure that you do that. Um, like I said, we got lots of reviews, but so far the two people that entered are going to win because Winners. nobody else is in. So make sure you take your time to do that. But uh, again, thank you so much. And if you haven't yet, if you got some value out of this, go ahead and share it with somebody that you think would also get some value. Um, that, that's it. Give us a thumbs up if you thought I wasn't too harsh. <laughs> Okay, That's, maybe not. Maybe not. It's a terrible one. Maybe no. not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Leave your comments, subscribe, like this video, and please share it so we can get more of this information out. Until next time, we'll see you right here on the Parrot Training Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Parrot Training Podcast with Dave and Jamie Womack. New episodes released every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific Time. Don't forget to subscribe and share this podcast.